Uh, for those of you virtual, uh, I'm Spud Woodward, uh, current chair of the commission. Um, our first item of business is approval of the agenda. Everybody should have a draft agenda. I know we have one or other item of other business, uh, New York, uh, Tatog. I assume you still want to do that, Jim? Yes, I was going to raise my hand and put that on, but I know the staff has done a wonderful job and got ahead of me. So, yes, thank you. All right. Okay. Any other additions, modifications to the agenda, draft agenda? Yes, Shana? I'd just like to add something under under uh, other business. I just wanted to quickly discuss um, our practices for doing transfer letters. I have some suggestions there that I kind of just wanted to throw at the policy board. Nothing super official. All right, I got that duly noted. Anything else? Uh, all right, any opposition to accepting the agenda as modified? Seeing none, we'll uh, consider that accepted by consent. We also have proceedings from the February 2023 meeting of the policy board. Are there any edits, modifications, corrections to those proceedings? I don't, anybody virtual will just see none. Uh, any opposition to accepting those proceedings uh, as presented? All right, we'll consider those accepted by consent as well. All right, this is the time in the policy board meeting where we'll have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, is there anyone in the room? I don't see anyone, anybody virtually who wants to make public comment. No, so okay, well, we'll dispense with that. So I'll uh, I'll give the the report from this morning's meeting of the executive committee. Um, we had several items we dealt with. Uh, first of all, which was the report on the draft uh, fiscal year 2024 budget. Um, our vice chair uh, is out of the country, and so uh, Laura went over the the draft budget and just remind everybody that pretty much. That budget is based off of the action plan that's been prior approved, uh, deliberated on and approved by the board. Um, so uh, we had unanimous approval of the proposed budget for 2024. And then we went into a uh, discussion about the stipend proposal and Bob Beal presented an overview of that. And, and Roy Miller uh, provided some comments yesterday during the uh, legislative and governor's appointees luncheon. Uh, there was a robust discussion about that uh, that policy. Just a little background on it. It was what, contemplating uh, financial compensation for legislative and governor appointee commissioners and proxies um, based on concerns that uh, the workload uh, over the years has expanded beyond just four quarterly commission meetings to requiring some of these commissioners to have to attend joint meetings with councils and other specialty meetings. Uh, after a pretty uh, lively discussion, uh, a motion was made, seconded, and ultimately approved with a vote of 14 to 1 to uh, maintain status quo, which is no financial compensation for legislative and governor appointee commissioners. However, uh, that vote was taken recognizing that there needs to be further work uh, to specifically determine the actual use of a stipend if we were to go forward because it's uh, it's kind of a complicated issue. You've got some LGA commissioners who simply wouldn't be eligible to receive a stipend even if it were available. You've got some that if it were available would just choose to not do it. So uh, the analyses that have been run were sort of a if everybody took advantage of it that was eligible. Uh, so there's going to be some further analysis of this and it's certainly not an issue that's off the table uh, but it'll be something that uh, the XCOM will probably contemplate uh, at a future um, so uh, and then uh, Tony went into uh, the conservation equivalency policy and technical guidance document update the draft of that uh, again there was a pretty lively discussion about that uh sort of the, the gist of it is that there's some good and there's some bad and there's some stuff that may not be very practical um uh, so um what we're going to do going forward is take the input that was provided by the the um 
XCOM, uh, take a subset of XCOM and other interested parties and, and get some further feedback on it. And then Bob and Tony will work uh, to refine this, this draft uh, and come back to the, um, the XCOM at probably the August meeting, assuming we can get everything done. And again, you know, the purpose of this is to, to as much as possible perfect the conservation equivalency guidance so that the flexibility is retained, but there it addresses concerns about it being a little too loose around the edges sometimes. So, uh, so again, this is a work in progress and hopefully this is something that we can bring to closure uh, before the end of the calendar year. And then we had a legislative update from Alexander Law. Uh, there are some, some bills at play um, across the river over there. One of them I think everybody may be aware of is, uh, and it's not a bill yet, but it's a discussion draft to uh, establish NOAA as a separate entity similar to EPA. Um, and um, Bob and I have talked about it uh, since it's kind of emerged. And you know, one, one of the concerns I think we have is that if you look at that discussion draft, the word fish is never even in there. It seems to be very focused on weather and climate and that sort of thing. So there's a little, you know, a little concern about uh, the consequences of that. You know, whether that'll get traction remains to be seen. But there were a few other bills, and uh, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is back in play. Uh, but again, it's uh, being confounded by the uh, who's going to pay for it part of the equation, which um, is, is still not resolved. But we'll continue to monitor those. The legislative committee is doing a great job of uh, maintaining high situational awareness on these. Uh, these bills and uh, when things start moving along, uh, we'll make sure that everybody is fully aware of opportunities for engagement to support or either um, convey concerns, you know, because uh, we all know that sometimes things are not what they appear to be uh, when these bills emerge out of Congress. So, uh, and then uh, we've got an update on future annual meetings. Uh, just to remind everybody, um, this year's annual meeting will be in both from North Carolina, October 15th through 19th. Um, and I uh, reminded everyone that the uh, the hotel we'll be using is actually built on the site of the former Menhaden reduction plant um, in Beaufort. And so uh, it's a great site, great hotel. And uh, it's hard to believe that they process millions and millions of Menhaden there, but it doesn't smell like that anymore. So don't worry about needing to bring your your own individual Febreze to the to the hotel. Uh, and that was uh, that was it. We did we did had closed session and we had the executive director's performance review. And uh, um, we're happy to say that we're going to have Bob for for a while longer. And uh, you know I think everybody agrees that Bob's doing a great job, and we're we're certainly happy to have him. So that's my report on the executive committee meeting. If there are any any questions. Uh, all right, seeing none, then we'll we'll move on to our next uh, item, and that is uh, discuss possible responses to issues identified in the commissioner survey. So Bob, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, at the last policy board meeting, in you know, at the winter meeting, the, you know, we went over the results of the commissioner survey, which we do annually, just sort of getting a, the tone of where the commissioners feel we are on, on work products and, and output of the commission and staffing and, and all the other things that we do at the commission. Um, and, the, and at the end of that presentation, there's a bit of a discussion. And then um, a couple of commissioners suggested, you know, what there, there's recommendations in there, especially in the open ended questions in that survey about you know things we can do better and things we can change and things we need to sort of start thinking about sort of in the in the longer term and we frankly didn't have enough time at the last meeting and, and needed to get our thoughts a little bit organized uh, to talk about that and that's what we're doing here um so there was a document that was included in the briefing material i think it was in supplemental tony is that right it wasn't i believe it's main materials oh, main materials okay and it's um it's just a one pager titled Commissioner Survey Results Summary, March 24th um, of this year. And kind of goes over the background that I talked about. You know, 29 commissioners responded to the survey this winter. And um, it, it breaks up the, 
the responses um, and just, you know, or lumps them into categories and breaks them up into a couple different groupings, short-term issues, long-term issues, and then the notion of drivers of change. You know, what, what's the commission going to have to react to over time? Um, the short-term issues um, that are listed there are um, getting meeting mat materials out earlier um, and, you know, brevity and clarity of these briefing materials. We get it. There's a lot of volume that's sent out in these briefing materials, and a lot of you guys said, sit on at least one council and everything else that you have to do homework on to get ready for these meetings. So any summary documents or brevity or decision documents or anything that we can use, I think would be would be effective there. Um, this one's a little bit difficult to define, improving the efficiency of meetings. I mean, I get it, quicker meetings is are more efficient, but if, uh, you know, not everyone gets to talk or you end up with results that, um, you know, you have to revisit or, or don't really represent the will of the group, maybe that's not efficient. So um, I think that one probably warrants some conversation. And um, again, back to summaries of lengthy documents, easier access to graphs and tables. Those are the, the, the pieces that I think a lot of people study and a picture's worth a thousand words kind of an idea. So getting to graphs and, and tables is always effective. Um, the long-term issues, bureaucracy and the federal partnership, um, you know, that's always out there. The notion of improving our partnership with uh, National Marine Fisheries and USGS and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the other federal agencies we interact with, obviously, is, is important and keeping those partnerships improving and evolving is great. Um, following science and not political pressure. Um, Shift, dealing with uh, shifting in stock allocations, uh, incorporation of ecological considerations. We do that for some of our species, but not all. Legislative changes, um, that's kind of what we talked about earlier in SPUD's update. You know, there's a lot of things being considered on Capitol Hill that may impact the commission and how we operate. They're not directly modifications to the Atlantic Coastal Act, but if things change under Endangered Species Act or if NOAA becomes its own entity and the word fish isn't anywhere in that bill that's considering that, that may be a problem and all those different things we have to consider. Um, offshore wind, uh, that's an obvious one, I think, that's going to be something we have to react to. And risk and uncertainty policy is something we've been developing for a while and we haven't fully implemented it yet. I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's just about ready for prime time. But the last time we talked about it, there was some... Um, interest in, in sort of test driving it one more time before we actually bought it. And then drivers of change, um, again, these are things we're going to have to react to as a commission over time and sort of big picture climate change and unpredictable environmental conditions uh, and stocks not responding to our management decisions. And, and you know, we've got a number of species that have, like, you know, northern shrimp's a great example or a terrible example, depending where you sit, of, you know, it, it that we've had a moratorium on that stock for the last seven years and the stock's not responding at all. And it's not because of obviously fishing mortality, it's an environmental condition. And, and you know, their commission sometimes is criticized because we're not rebuilding some stocks, even though we've got full moratorium, a moratoria implemented on, you know, northern shrimp and sturgeon and other fisheries we've cut way back to just, just sort of um, there's remnants of what the fisheries used to be and the stocks aren't responding for a lot of different reasons, environmental conditions and, and other things. So that's a quick summary. You know, I think, again, the short term issues are something that we we feel we can tackle. And if there's specific recommendations from this group on how to handle some of the meeting efficiencies and meeting materials, we want to hear them and we'll, we're happy to react to that. Um, the longer term issues, the idea there is, is there something that we as a we as staff or you all as a group of 45 commissioners should be working toward to react to those longer term issues um we're, we're happy to help move in that direction so happy to answer any questions mr chair but that's a, a summary of the background thank you bob um yeah so i just want to offer a few minutes maybe uh if folks are willing uh and ready to provide some feedback to, to Bob on some of these, especially the efficiency of meetings. I think that one is particularly challenging. You know, it's a, during the meeting planning phase, you know, there's a effort made to allocate a sufficient amount of time uh, to ensure that there can be adequate discussions. Uh, so obviously some things are more complex than others. Um, but I think that's, as Bob said, one of those things like what, what where are we looking at to change the status quo to gain efficiency. Are we talking about the length of meetings, the time allocated for board meetings? If there's anybody's got any thoughts on that, and certainly, you know, if you, you, you can communicate those outside of the policy board meeting environment to me, to Bob, to 
to Tony, to whoever. Um, but if anybody's got any thoughts now, uh, I'd certainly appreciate hearing them. Yes, sir, Senator Waters. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, one thing I, I wanted to mention is that in our Capitol Hill visits yesterday, of course, as I was um, presenting some materials to each of our delegation uh, staffers um, about the ongoing planning to establish a 11-state uh, group on the Atlantic coast to look at mitigation and compensation issues for fisheries related to offshore wind. And um, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission has no position on offshore wind. Um, fine, uh, but it it just suggests to me that maybe we do need to have more directed um, commission involvement in the policy that is being developed for in offshore wind industry related to um, fisheries and environment uh, protection, mitigation, and compensation. And uh, I I think that in a way there will be an expectation I think of the states and the fishing industry to look to this group because of our expertise in fisheries management to have some kind of opinion as to what measures are being taken, um, whether it's in the uh, BOEM environmental review once auctionaries have been described or whether it might be on a policy about states um, establishing funds uh, for receipt of industry or um, federal funds for mitigation and compensation and of course that you know may uh, involve issues about how such funds get divided among states that are fishing out of the same species that might migrate and be affected in different ways so i'm just really not in uh, you know i i'm i know we have a lot of areas in which this would come up but i'm wondering whether there needs to be an opportunity for a particular focus uh, in the commission on the offshore wind industry, wind industry on the Atlantic states. All right, thank you, Senator. I know Bob is, is involved uh, with Boehm's uh, discussion. So Bob, maybe you can just kind of update everybody where, what you've been participating in, how you've been providing feedback and, and some of the discussions we've had uh, internally about the role of ASMFC in, in this wind, offshore wind uh, topic. Great. Thank you. Happy to do that. Yeah, you know, to be honest, the commission's kind of wandering around a little bit in the woods trying to find our direction on, on offshore wind. Um, you know, the, there has been, as you said, a lot of engagement with that 11 state group, which is the states of Maine through uh, North Carolina, um, but it doesn't include Pennsylvania since they're, you know, don't have the offshore issues. Um, and the commission, frankly, has stepped back a little bit since that group has become more active and let let those 11 states in there there you know obviously it's external to the commission process but those 11 states have been represented and are talking quite a bit and um you know i have as as uh, the chair mentioned been involved with bohm and some of the data groups on mitigation um and compensation and you know a number of congressional offices have reached out to us in the past trying to get our perspective on compensation and mitigation legislation. What should that look like? Who should be involved? Um, should the commission, frankly, be the clearinghouse for all of that money, which uh, generally the folks around this table have said we, we probably shouldn't be the group that makes decisions on who gets the money and how much they get. Um, but, you know, there may be a role for ASMOC in providing data to the group that ultimately makes those decisions through ACCSP and other things, They you know, on harvest history and other things for commercial and for higher uh, fisheries. So, you know, we, 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 I'm involved in a lot of different angles. The, the state directors in particular are involved in a lot of different parts of wind power. Uh, the commission, you know, this body hasn't really formally done a lot collectively. There's a lot of sort of pieces that are very involved in it, but, but collectively the commission hasn't done a lot. Um, and while I'm speaking, you know, this, Tomorrow at one o'clock and Friday at one o'clock, Alexander and I are doing a congressional briefing on uh, compensation legislation um, that we've invited essentially all the coastal offices uh, from the House and Senate side. If the House is on Thursday, Senate's on Friday, I believe. Um, so if anyone is interested in participating in that, sort of hearing what um, you know the 11 states have been up to and hearing the perspective from a couple of congressional offices on where some of that legislation may go. Those are open-ended meetings and, and you know the invite is available for anyone that's interested in doing that. Um, so 
Senator Waters, you know, it's a long-winded way of saying we're doing we're doing a lot of pieces of wind power and, and involved at a lot of different levels at the staff level and obviously at the state level, but we haven't we don't have a, a you know wind power committee or anything set up at, at the commission and, and historically we've we've talked about it a lot and decided kind of this piecemeal approach may be appropriate for the commission rather than than you know a, a larger um, you, know, you know more dedicated commitment to coming up with one position because it's it's difficult for 15 states to come up with one position on wind power different governors have different perspectives and it's just a a lot of times when it's a controversial issue or something that governors and, and legislative folks disagree on the commission's position is kind of watered down a lot and it, and it doesn't doesn't say a whole lot but again that's that's what we've done historically that doesn't have to be what we're doing you know what we do moving forward if there's something different that we can and should do that's for this group to decide all right, thank you, Bob. All right, um, again, uh, in regards to the survey results and the issues, um, you know, if you, if you don't, you know, feel about dealing with it today, individually, please circle back to myself, Bob, Joe, you know, share your 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 thoughts and, and ideas about how to address some of these things. We, we'd appreciate it. So, Lauren, I saw your hand. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate always the, the uh, opportunity to uh, provide feedback to the commission. I, I consider it a, a serious and important uh, part of my role. Uh, I'm wondering, though, about the number of re of respondents compared to the ones that do not respond. Has, has that norm changed over the years? And uh, is there anything else that we should do that would tend to increase the number of responders. Uh, I personally think that the a document is efficient, it's easy to use, it um, is valued, and uh, I, I couldn't propose any ways that we would change, but perhaps others in, mem in our, uh, our group here could. So that's my question, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll look to Tony for the specifics, but I think our, our participation trends have remained kind of stable over, over time you know i thought maybe we could offer an all expense paid trip to arlington virginia as an incentive but i guess that really won't work but uh but anyway i'll i'll look to tony for that it's fine you're correct it is i think it we've had some low years of like you know, maybe 21 or 22 individuals responding and some high years of like closer to 35 but on average i don't think we veer too far from like five or six difference every year um, because this, the survey is anonymous, it's hard for us to sort of incentivize folks. We just send out the reminder emails when it's really low. I ask Spud to send out a, a, a reminder email that maybe motivates some more folks. Um, so if you all have ideas of what would push you to fill out the survey, I bring it back to you all since you're the ones that are filling it out. Please um, let me know and I'm happy to utilize those methods. Thank you, Ray. And then Eric. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tony, question, uh, 29 surveys out of a possible 45 were fulfilled. Are the legislative committee people like governor's appointee and proxies and legislative appointments responding more so than the directors from each state? The survey is in, I cannot tell you. Pardon me, but after you fill out the survey, you're supposed to notify the office that you filled it out. So I don't really know how anonymous it is. I don't really care. But, you know, I'm just curious to know, maybe the directors are too embroiled in other work to take time to fill out the survey. I'd be curious to know if the appointees, the legislative appointees and governor's appointees are filling out the survey. Thank you. So if 29 people filled it out, maybe 15 people told us that they did. So <laughs> I still can't tell you. <laughs> Yeah, that's that non-response bias. You know, it's always a problem in everything we do, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you can't get one. <laughs> that's right. That's right. 
All right, Eric, what about the game? We played a game years ago where everybody had a little button. We had a game. No more games. Yeah, okay. All right. But you want to get you want to get the hundred percent response or something like that. Bring back the game. We'll take that in consideration. The game. All right. Again, I encourage you, uh, Tom. As my BA and my MBA is marketing management, I realize if you get that many responses to a survey, that percentage you're doing great because usually you get three, four, five percent. So you've you've done fantastic. And I never send back that I do it, but I do it every year because, and you probably wish I didn't because I usually complain every year. <laughs> I mean, the survey does, that's how surveys are. And if, you know, I don't know how most of you people, you probably, because you're directors and things like that, get more emails than I, and I'm still getting 300 emails a day from all the, all the people that want to send me and tell me what they want. So you get bogged down and you forget. As we get older, our memories is not as good as we used to be. So he says, oh, I forgot about that survey. And luckily, you send out three or four reminders. So I think we're doing good. Thanks. Bill, do you have your hand up? Yeah, we're all asking ourselves over here, what's the game? <laughs> <laughs> you can, there's controls that you can do and like it immediately fill out responses to questions that are up on the screen so you would fill out the survey here at the meeting and you hit the button you wouldn't yeah i'll leave that up we can certainly put some thought into bringing you back the game i guess we would have to buy it. yeah i mean yeah there's there's costs associated with it but uh yeah, you know, I think probably one of the, the 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 issues that we always face is that okay, so we fill out the survey, we get the summary of the results, but where does that change anything? And I think that's what we're trying to do here with this is at least identify the issues that have emerged out of it, and where where are some of these things actionable? You know, where do we take some of those survey results and put them into action to affect change that people want to see? So that again, that, that I'm gonna put the burden back on y'all to. You know to continue the feedback loop if you you know if you identify an issue you know help us identify a solution you know because that's how we get things done so we'll with that we'll we'll move on um our, our next agenda item and just to, uh frame it up for for tony is uh back in february we have some questions were raised regarding atlanta benito management um, and then we also ended up discussing uh, some similar concerns about uh, false albacore. So um, Tony's going to give us an update on some of the internal analysis that have been done regarding uh, management of those two species. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to point out that there were some additional materials added, um, one from the state of Massachusetts on uh, measures that they are thinking about putting in place for Atlantic Benito and then also there were reports that were um, compiled um, on both of these subjects that were quite extensive um, on uh, subjects both of these species um, on life history landings um, and assessment information where available and management information where available um, so um, so uh, this uh, in the white paper that was in your meeting materials, there was information from the states about whether or not they would be able to implement management measures for this species if the commission did or did not have an FMP. Um, but before we get into those pieces, um, if we were to add any additional species, to the commission's um, portfolio. Um, it would impact both commission staff and the state staff. Uh, we would probably either need to have another ISFMP staff member and possibly a new stock assessment scientist, or we would need to have measurable changes in the current species priorities for both management and stock assessments. And we would have to have some pretty major shifts in order to take this on if we don't add additional staff. And then as well as the states yourselves would need to be able to populate TCs, stock assessment subcommittees, plan development teams, and PRTs for both of these species, um, which I can 
imagine may be a little difficult or maybe not for some of the states depending on um, your staffing situations. Um, and then next slide, one more. Yep. Um, so for the states that could implement management measures on their own, um, in the table, I hadn't heard back from two of the states, but in my presentation, I've included information for them. Um, so the, that's the first option. States could just put measures in on their own for one or both of these species. Um, there are four states that cannot put measures in on their own, but there are some caveats for those states. For South Carolina and Delaware, um, they would not be able to move by themselves, but if there were federal measures, they could follow those. For North Carolina and Maryland, they cannot move on their own unless they started a state FMP, but that could take several years to do so. I believe North Carolina is thinking about doing a FMP for false albacore, if that's correct, Chris, or not still thinking about it. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Tony. Um, not necessarily an FMP, it's a little nuanced. Uh, the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission is considering uh, moving forward with uh, rulemaking authority for false albacore. Uh, we don't have rulemaking authority, so we can't set regulations uh, unless uh, unless that species uh, is managed through ASMFC or either the Mid or South Atlantic Councils. Um, that, that will take a few years. Uh, to to get in place just kind of through the rulemaking process uh, in order for us to, to set regulations and then we could do that if that happened we could do that without an FMP we can just have um, you know a rule that gives the director proclamation authority similar to what we have now for sheep's head because we have sheep's head regs but no FMP but, but it'll take a few years and it would uh, only limit uh, our regulations to uh, our, our state waters so uh, it's, it's, it's limited in scope considering the, the range of false albacore. Thanks, Chris. Um, the second option, if the board is interested in taking a next step for these two, one or both of these two species, is to have staff develop a white paper that would be similar to what we did with whelk. Um, and maybe that's five years ago now, time just flies. Um, and this white paper would um, have information on um, distribution, habitat, life history, landings, any management um, history. I would probably borrow from those wonderful uh, papers that were in the uh, supplemental materials because um, a lot of that work has been done through that paper. Um, and then lastly is a fishery improvement project or a FIP. Um, it's a stepwise multi-stakeholder effort to improve fishery management practices. It's often used more for species that have a, a larger commercial fishery um, in as an incentive to have more um, sustainable management for that species. It often goes along with certifications. Um, we did do a FIP process when we did the Jonah crab fishery uh, and there were um, processors, uh, uh, grocery stores involved. I'm not sure that's the best fit for these two species. There isn't as heavy of a commercial fishery for these um, that I am aware of, but um, I'm open to different ideas. And that is all I have on my presentation. All right, thanks, Tony. And I want to make sure that we acknowledge the, the efforts of the American Saltwater Guides Association who, uh, who took it upon themselves to have, uh, you know, a literature search done and provide that information back to us, which certainly uh, reduces the burden on the commission for better understanding the the biology, population dynamics, and other elements of the of these two species. So we want to want to make sure we acknowledge them. They did this on their own, and and certainly uh, I think it sets a good model that you know if you come to the commission with a conservation concern and you you put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. So we certainly certainly appreciate that. So um, I've got David Borden has had his hand up virtually, so I'm going to start off with him and anyone else at this point. So I've got uh, Chris Bat Savage and Senator Water. So David, can you hear me? Hello. David, um, am I? We have you, I think. You're self muted.
How about now? There you go. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize uh, for not being at the meeting, uh, but uh, I, I have had a chance to go through the, the different documents. I'd like to start by commending the Mass DMF and the Saltwater Guides Association for all the work that they've done on these two. I think that they're being proactive, which is what the intent is. Um, that said, I don't think we're at a juncture where we need to delve into the specifics or have a detailed discussion of how we utilize the information. I think it, it's actually re, uh, premature. I appreciate the fact that Tony and staff have, have identified a number of different ways forward, but I think there's kind of an interim step that we need to, to follow, which would be a technical uh, review uh, of the documents or, that are available. Uh, and I'm also concerned about workload issues that Tony uh, identified and work priorities. So uh, my suggestion is, uh, that, and I've developed like a tasking uh, motion. My uh, suggestion is that we uh, basically move forward and uh, ask the states directly, have the commission send a letter uh, to the state directors and ask that they appoint a technical or a management staff to the committee if they so choose and the operable words there are if they so choose. And then let the state uh, staff do the work and send uh, prepare comments and suggestions. I think if we follow that format, we'll be in a, in a position where uh, we can uh, then have a little bit more of a consensus on, on the different strategies that we might uh, want to uh, utilize in the in the future, and the one thing that I, I that would pretty much leave the commission um, out of this unless they want to have a staff member participate in those those discussions. Uh, but, uh, I think the one thing that would be useful would be to have one of the states uh, volunteer to coordinate that activity. So, as I said before, I prepared a motion. Uh, but I'm going to defer to the chair whether or not we use the motion. I think it, it might be possible if people like that idea to just do it by consensus. But that's up to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. And yes, uh, we I've got a copy of your motion, so we'll we'll keep that in the queue. And I want to go now to uh, Chris Bat Savage and then Senator Waters. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting idea that, that David Borden is bringing forward to get, get the states together, especially those with um, active fisheries for, for most species to figure, to look at the, the, the available information. But I think also, I think what might also be in there too is just to get a sense of, uh, of what management could look like. Um, just, you know, with our ASMFC species or some species, we manage pretty, pretty intensely. We have a lot of information. Uh, we spend a lot of time on them. There's others that, I guess for lack of a better term, is kind of passive management where we have regulations in place and you know, they're not revisited a whole lot. And, uh, and both options have, a, have you know, different different workload uh, responsibilities uh, you know, for, for, for the states or if it was ASMFC in this case. Um, but I think it would also be helpful too if this was you know, an, ultimately something the states decided to do on their own outside of uh, ASMFC or the council's uh, to at least work together with, uh, come up with at least some kind of the relatively um, similar regulations that are kind of meeting the same objectives. Um, but that, that's, you know, if, that, if that's something that's, that would be considered under what David's uh, proposing, um, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think that would be a good, a good way to go in addition to the other things he suggested. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Senator Waters. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So kind of a question for um, Tony and, and for Bob as well, um, in that, you know, I can see the consequences in terms of cost if we did an FMP for the SMFC, and um, there we are, because it is asking a lot to bring in new species um, to the commission. Um, so my questions are kind of are around what are the consequences potentially of our not taking species under management and what where might we what situation might we find ourselves in and and i think it's not unrelated to the question of, of that this we may be seeing more of this 
because of what's happening with certain fisheries, pressures will develop on other species. And then, of course, with warming um, of the oceans, we're seeing ex the ranges extended. And so the fishing might start occurring in places where these species weren't, be, weren't before. So, um, you know, what, what situation do we find ourselves in a few years from now in terms of potential depletion or um, potential conflicts among the states? And, uh, and I, as I said, I don't expect this will be the first time that we notice something like this occurring. I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's hard to say what the exact consequence would be without having a stock assessment for these species and knowing how much fishing is going on or not going on, whether that fishing is going on in state waters versus federal waters. Um, and so it's difficult to say. I mean, yes, there potentially could be consequences, obviously, for not managing in particular if there's an emerging fishery that continues to get bigger and there are no management measures on that species. Um, you know, uh, it's one of the reasons why we uh, took action on Jonah crab, um, because we were concerned we were seeing the landings uh, increase significantly um, very quickly. So. Yeah, I think we'd all like to be more precautionary than we are reactive. But I think there's always that that trying to figure out that balance, you know, and and you and to and to determine whether a precautionary approach is is necessary. You've got an under, better understand of risk, and I think that's what's challenging in a lot of these situations. Is okay, what what kind of risk of over exploitation or, or whatever are we dealing with? And a lot of times, you know, we're, we've got species that we just don't have a very <clears throat> thorough and complete data set on. So anyway, I mean, that, that's kind of, I think where we face right now, but uh, Dan, and then I'm gonna go to Adam Nowalski online. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so to Senator Warda's question, you know, the reason we're even having this conversation is we received reports and, and many of us have seen it personally that the Gulf of Maine is seeing these young of the year juvenile bonito that we've never seen before. So uh, constituents wrote to me and, and I said, well, we'll take a look at it and why don't we inform ASMFC because heck, maybe this was happening in Rhode Island forever or Connecticut and now they've just moved up north and there's nothing new. But if it is new and these fish are vulnerable because they've been taken as functional bait as if you know, people taking buckets of them or whatever, maybe it's appropriate to, to put a, a squeeze on that and to prevent them from doing that. So my, my objective going into this, looking at our Massachusetts statutory authority was to, um, you know, go to my state commission and propose uh, a, a very, a very uh, simple regulation to curtail that activity if it was deemed warranted. And I was hoping getting sort of informal feedback from this group from my neighboring states in a forum like this would give us um, some of that motivation. Um, I did have a question, if you would indulge me, to Chris Batsavage. Chris, you mentioned that in your rulemaking, you'd only be able to affect the state waters catch, but could you not enact a possession rule that could be enforced at the pier upon landing? Uh, you know, yes, thanks for the, the, the question, Dan. <clears throat> yeah, so if people were out in federal waters uh, fishing, uh, when they come into our state waters, uh, they're, they're bound to the, uh, the state regulations. Okay, and as far as David Borden's um, conceptual ideas, uh, we would be uh, supportive of that and we would provide staff to um, create a white paper if that's appropriate um, and to just move this forward. I, but I'm mindful that I don't know if uh, we would regret going down the road of a new species in a management plan, but um, it would be ideal as we've already kind of um, submitted to the to the to this board um, some research. And if we want to go a little bit further and dive into other states' uh, data as well, that that may be appropriate. But uh, I hope I haven't um, uh, overburdened this board or the commission. But I do think it's appropriate when we see these emerging issues to at least. Uh, start the conversation and possibly take some action. Thank you, Dan. I'm going to go to Adam online and then it'll be Erica Burgess. Great. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I certainly uh, support any organization out there that's willing to put their money where their mouth is and 
fun science. Uh, that's certainly for the benefit of the resource as well as all of us as managers. Uh, my understanding is that the literature that we did receive from ASGA so far is in draft form and is without peer review at present time. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. It is not peer-reviewed, yes. Okay. So again, I, I certainly appreciate the efforts, but I do think whatever decisions we make moving forward should be based on uh, independently uh, funded science uh, that goes through a peer review process as we do with almost all the other data we review. Uh, and I certainly think that would be part of as we move forward, uh, we've got to look at ways to go ahead and get that data to inform our decision making. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, what we received from the American Saltwater Guys Association is really just a literature review of everything that was out there and really no, one, no stock status determination or anything like that that would typically require a peer review. But uh, again, you know, it, it never hurts to have someone else look at it and see where the gaps are and, and, and uh, how thorough that is. But uh, thank you for that, Adam. And I'm going to go to uh, Erica Burgess and then Eric Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Florida has looked into the need for conservation and management of Little Tunny for multiple times over the last decade and greater. And we've routinely come to the determination that uh, management, additional management of this species is not warranted. So if, for that reason, um, I do not see our need to continue to explore this. this might be something that other states might wish to do for their waters, but off of Florida, um, where we land upwards of 50% of the coastwide landings for that species, if we've determined that management is not warranted and we have the ability to implement regulations in our state waters and adjacent federal waters in the absence of an FMP, um, I can't support this. And I uh, would welcome other states to explore options that they can do within their uh, own authorities but um, consistently we arrive at the same conclusion. And um, if you'd like to know more, I'd be happy to chat with others offline. All right, thank you. All right, Eric Reed, and then I'm gonna go to Jim Gilmore. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, these two species are highly migratory and they're available throughout the Northwest Atlantic and all of, as well as a lot of other places in the Atlantic. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that uh, the service follows ICAT regulations for these two species, which do not exist. However, you know, you talk about a white paper and doing a white paper is one thing, reading somebody else's white paper is much more cost efficient, I believe. Uh, on May 15th through 18th at the ICAT intersessional meeting of the Small Tuna's Working Group, they're looking at uh, reviewing the stats for biology and life history, age and growth, genetics, maturity, and reproduction. Uh, and they're also going to get an update on data poor methods and review appropriate approaches for future development. Now, I, I'm pretty sure that the future in ICAT time is like, you know, my great great grandkids might have a problem with with it's something along those lines. So, and and, and my final point is that the IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature puts out a thing called the Red Book, which is species of most concern and species of least concern. It is the premier document about uh, species status, lists both these species of species of least concern. And in my little Red Book, they are also species of least concern. The commission's got plenty of other things to do that are more pressing as we've just heard for the last two days and probably for some time before that. And I don't think we should waste commission resources on taking on this, these two particular species because there is very little that is known about them. They're, opportuni they're opportunistic in where they appear on the coast. Uh, and of course, fishermen are opportunistic as well. But I mean, People have been fishing for these fish for a very long time. And I, I don't I don't see any reason we should get in this management scheme at all. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. All right, thank you. Eric, uh, Jim Gilmore, and then I'll go to Tom Pody. 
Thanks, Chairman. And as following up with uh, Senator Waters' comment before, I think at this point, um, yeah, we, we have a system where if we're seeing this in our states, you know, we, we tend to react to it and, and try to put in some management if it becomes an issue. And, um, and as Tony said, it's worked well. I mean, we saw it happening with uh, Jonah Crab and it started out with states noticing it and then we decided to do uh, you know an effort on it. In fact, right now in New York, if anybody wants to help us, we're going to do stuff on blowfish because uh, they're back in big numbers and people are getting concerned about that. Um, however, the one caution we do is that you know if we kick this down the road or whatever um not to forget that sometimes and i'll use welk as the example uh, a few years back we all decided we really need to manage welk and there was a state well to the north of us i won't say who and former people had killed that and then it took connecticut and new york what 10 years to get welk regulations in and we probably did damage to that population so and some points when we get to that tipping point, the commission is very helpful in getting us to say, if we try to do it in the state and we get a lot of opposition, it's difficult to do it. If it says, well, the commission told us to do it, it's a lot easier. So we got to keep that in mind as we move forward. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Tom, and then I'll go to Melville. Jim covers the points I was going to make, so I'll, I'll pass. Oh, sorry, repeat that. I was trying to keep up with my list here. And, oh, okay. All right, very good. All right, Mel, and then I'll go back to David Borden online. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I was just going to say we, in our state, just because of how we're set up, it's even a little more complex. Um, you know, I think the states that can implement uh, through rulemaking or some process something in place as Dan has done, that's great. We, we have an additional challenge in that all of our uh, fisheries regulation is actually state law, which requires an act of the General Assembly, and they only have authority for state waters. And the point about, well, couldn't the state restrict um, harvest? Uh, the problem we run into there is we, we've had a case in federal court where we've lost before when we tried to do that. So that's not even a, unless, our best case scenario is, is basically adopting federal regulation by reference in the existing state law. So we have some additional challenges too. And the other thing is that we don't have the same degree perhaps of, uh, we haven't really heard from our fishermen that the, the same degree of interest. And there is, you know, the, the species are landed. There's some uh, uh, issues probably with identification just because of use of common names or common names switching around, but uh, I would say, depending on which species you're talking about, you know, most of ours are probably in federal waters. Uh, so just some additional challenges, uh, but it would certainly, we're not in a position to, you know, to take some sort of action at this point, nor could we just make that clear. Thanks, Mel. All right, uh, David, I'm gonna go back to you and then Lynn and then Justin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll make this uh, quick because it's my second bite. Um, I, I didn't. I, I just want everybody to be clear. I did not suggest that we start managing these species. I think that's. I specifically said that it was premature. The only thing I suggested was a variation of what Adam uh, indicated that we need some kind of review on this. There's a lot of work that's been done. I think we need a, a set of outside eyes to look at the information and see what we can use uh, and not use and where it might possibly lead. And then at a subsequent meeting, put that back on the table and then have some aspects of what have already been discussed uh, discussed. Um, so I was just suggesting an interim step. That's all. Thank you. David, you, you alluded to the fact that you, you've got a motion that you uh, have constructed and provided to staff. Do you want to make that motion to maybe focus this? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to make that as a motion, but I was kind of hoping that we could avoid do that, uh, doing that simply because it, this does not, what I was suggesting does not commit uh, the commission to anything other than writing one letter. Um, doesn't change any work priorities, doesn't change uh, any assignments for the 
technical staff that are already overburdened. But if it's your preference, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to make that as a motion. Well, we've got it uh, displayed up on, on the board now. I think at least the language of that motion will maybe help people better understand what you're talking about. So, okay. Uh, so uh, I, I move that the commission establish a temporary technical working committee to review the two papers on Atlantic Benito and Little Tooney that were submitted by the American Saltwater Guides Association. The commission will inform the state directors of this proposal and ask them to nominate scientific staff members of their choice to review the proposal. Uh, the review will assess the technical quality of the papers, the relevance of the information, and suggest possible revision, data gaps, and management impl implications and options. Uh, the committee will uh, convene online, elect their own chairperson, and prepare a report with their findings and recommendations for pre presentation to the policy board at the summer meeting. All right, thank you. So we have a motion to have a second. You got a second from Justin Davis? All right. Uh, let's hold discussion on that till I go down the rest of my list here. And you can certainly discuss that if you want to. But uh, I want to go to Lynn and then and then Justin and then Mike Wayne online and Pat Keller. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out on a slightly um, a slight tangent that we've been having a little fun with um, Seafood Watch. Um, and I just wanted to say for the record that Cobia is up on Seafood Watch. Cobia is, and the um, alternate name is Benito. Um, so just so people are aware, we know Benito are not Cobia and Cobia are not Benito, but they are listed as the same critter um, under the Seafood Watch. So. All right, thanks, uh, Justin, and then I'm going to go to Mike Wayne, and then Dan, Eric, and Dan. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief, and I, I think this is a good motion. It's a good approach suggested by David. Um, I think, Mr. Chairman, you said earlier something about being precautionary and not reactive. I think just because there's a perception there's not an issue with these fish right now is not a reason to not look into it gather information, talk about what sort of precautionary regulation might be appropriate. So this seems like a good next step, acknowledging the uh, the interest from some members of the public and seeing the commission work towards some precautionary management. So I think this is a, a good approach suggested by David. All right, thanks. Okay, Mike Wayne online, is that right? Uh, I think he wants to speak to the motion. Go ahead, Thank Mike. You, thank you, Mr. Chair, you got me? I got you, loud and clear. Thanks, yeah, so I've been trying to keep tabs on this. Um, and I, you know, as this continues to be discussed at ASMFC and perhaps specifically across the states, I'm just curious about what the plan is to engage the broader recreational fishing community on this discussion. I think ASGA has done a good job messaging this to the light tackle community, but there's there's a lot of other stakeholders um, <clears throat> within the recreational fishing industry that would be very interested in this discussion. And so I just want to flag this before this thing gets too far down the field. Um, I don't believe it's ASGA's intent to try to sneak in regulations on these species. So I think a little help from some of the communication professionals within the states and at ASMFC would be would be needed uh, as this conversation continues. So I just want to flag this because I don't really feel like that's being discussed right now. I want to make sure that it's in the mix. Thanks. Mike, at this time, there is, I mean, depending on what happens with this motion, even if this motion passes, there is no commission FMP, so there would be no commission public hearings on this if the commission does decide to take this species on. 
as an FMP, then we would do our regular um, FMP process where we scope first, and that's when we would start to engage with the public on any types of or the different types of broad scale management that we would do, and then we would then identify with the board specific management measures and then take those back out for public comment so that we would be following our regular process. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair, just a quick follow up. Go ahead. So, based on Tony's response, am I am I interpreting that as there are no plans to engage the broader stakeholders on this until management is being considered? Because that wasn't really the point I was trying to make. So I just wanted a little clarity. We haven't decided, like there's, there has been no decision. This motion is on the table. Um, and this motion, the way David describes it is for the states to do all of these things. The commission actually would not be doing this work. It would be up to the states. So if the states wanted, the states that decide they wanna be a part of this group, wanted to engage with the public, that would be up to those individual states. But the commission itself is not actually taking on any management at this time. Understood. So, Mr. Chair, perhaps my comments are best directed to the states then. Thank you. There, thank you, Mike. Did I miss you, Pat? All right, sorry, sorry, go ahead. You went right over me to Mike Wayne and I'll never forgive you for that, Jim. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is, to Tony's point, this is not a commission issue then. And we're making a motion. It's a, this is a process problem. We're making a motion to then direct the states, and the commission isn't involved. So this should be a voluntary action by the states. If the states want to get together and do this, then, then I would suggest that that's the direction that we go in. I, I don't have a dog in this fight, other than the fact that I love catching Benito and Albacore, and and think that if there was warranted need to manage then we should be moving in that direction. But for, for this first step, I, I, I almost feel like this is out of order. Yeah, uh, I think we do have a little bit of a disconnect here between intent and procedure. Um, but we now have something that belongs to the policy board, so we gotta do something with it one way or the other. And uh, so I'd really like to, let's try to bring this, tighten up this conversation here because uh, we are getting repeating on our time we have other issues to deal with so um i'm gonna go to, to eric real quick and then and then erica and then i've got mike ruscio and then uh tom and then back to you justin and let's try to wrap this up yeah thank you mr chair i'll be brief i agree with mr kelleher um this is this the commission should stay out of that that's my position and to Ms. fegley's point that's why i cited the red book not sea watch because they know what they're talking about and when they say it's of least concern they mean it so just so you know all right erica thank you mr chair i am most concerned about the process and the precedent that this motion is establishing that the commission would turn around and write a letter to the states to say hey you need to put your technical staff to work to review the work of a private organization um, and do peer review so would any body who submits a report to asmfc through public comment then be directed would the states be directed to review the technical merit of those reports that is a slippery slope and i am um, very uncomfortable with as i indicated earlier florida has undergone technical review of whether the species needs management multiple times i cannot support a letter from this body to the state of Florida to ask that they participate in further review. Thank you. All right, uh, Mike Ruccio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll also try to be brief. I, I admit that I don't have a particular dog in this fight, but I am struggling with this motion a little bit. Um, I'm cognizant of the comments that Mr. Reed made regarding work that's being done at uh, tuna management bodies. Um, I'm also aware of the documentation that's already been provided by MassDMF and Dan McKiernan's staff and, and would like to see those incorporated in this if there is a comprehensive review. But I think that the part that I'm struggling with the most is perhaps 
what those findings and recommendations from this technical review are designed to do. Um, it, it's one thing to conduct a literature review, but I, I'm, I'm finding myself lacking for how is this directing towards a next step and whether that involves the commission, consideration of management, to empower the states to, to pursue their own regulation. And I'm just a little bit unclear of that. And I think some of that is playing out in, in others' comments as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right, Tom Fody and Justin, and I think I'm going to call the question on this so we can dispense with it. Yeah. Basically, the, the fishery in New Jersey has always been, uh, and in New York, mostly because I used to fish from in New York, was in federal waters. We don't really have a fishery in state waters. It's all federal waters. And, you know, and it ain't because there's bunker coming in, because if you, if you fish for Benita, you know that they, they've taken small spearing and small fish. Now, it's different from albacore. Albacore has always been in state waters. So I really think it's part of NOAA's responsibility if they want to look at it, because New Jersey and New York, it's, it's federal waters. And it's not a, a species that comes in our bays and estuaries. All right. Thanks, Tom. All right, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my sense is the misgivings about this motion around the table are mostly around the idea that this is something that's directing the states to do something when, you know, we think maybe the commission doesn't have the ability to do that. I'm wondering if resolution to that issue is rather than calling this a temporary technical committee saying that we're establishing a work group, that it's going to review this information and that it's going to meet and then come back to this body at some point with a summary of the information they've reviewed and some recommendations about different ways to move forward. I think there's some interest around the table and not dropping this issue altogether, but I think there's also a sense that we don't have enough information right now to decide what to do. Um, you know, for instance, we've heard that Florida has examined this issue multiple times and has presumably done some sort of analysis and, you know, review of policy options and, and has arrived at the idea that this is a, it's not necessary to regulate these species. I'm curious to learn more about that. So um, I'm just wondering if, if, you know, we amended this motion to call it a work group and struck a lot of the language directing exactly what the group is going to do and made it simpler. That would help recognizing that would drag this out longer, but just offering that. Um, my sense is that there is some trepidation with the commission asking anybody to do anything at this point with, with this. And and that's why I think we're probably at the point of just vote this up or vote it down. Uh, and, and perhaps we've had a good discussion, leave it to the states that have an interest in pursuing this individually to find a mechanism to collaborate together. And, and because right now I, I do think we've got a procedural and an authority issue here that that's uh, bad. So, um, I'd really like to dispense with this if at all possible. So uh, I know Doug, you had your hand up. I wanna, you haven't had a chance yet. I'll, I'll go. I'll let you have the last word on this, and then I want to have a vote on it. All right. Just briefly, you know, if if we dispense with this by t passing it down or uh, voting it down, that's fine. Yeah. But what I was going to say is, if this commission has uh, thought of having um, us get involved with Bonita management. Um, historically, we used to have a group called the Management and Science Committee that would direct them to look into that issue and then bring forward a, uh, a paper uh, describing the pros and cons of it. But if you want to just get rid of it, that's fine. No, I think that's a, that's a good point. Uh, but again, you know, it's I think what we're, what we're really dealing with here is is we've got states that individual have an interest in in this and maybe pursuing some conservation and we have some that obviously don't and and uh i think we we've got to we're gonna we're not gonna have any public comment on it appreciate you being here but i think we've got to resolve this issue and, and we're running out of time so uh so at that point i'm gonna call the question on this we have a motion before us uh all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye yeah. all right got the caucus for a minute or two. All right, uh, our time's up on caucus. So I'm ready to call for vote. All those in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand. Yeah. Connecticut. 
Rhode Island. All right. Those opposed? New Hampshire, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and Massachusetts. Sorry, Dan. All right. Uh, no votes. One no. North Carolina. And abstentions. No fisheries and fish and wildlife service. Nope. Over here. And Maine and PRFC. Okay. So motion fails. All right. So where does that leave us? All right. Tony, up, up, Dan, go ahead. What was mentioned earlier in the discussion, but we didn't really um, proceed down this road, is to attack this like we did Welk, which was voluntary. Uh, we each, uh, I think uh, Pat Gear had organized it. Uh, he found us some C grant money. And, uh, you know, we all contributed to, you know, all of our technical information and our regulations. And we had numerous conference calls. And I think that's probably more appropriate to do that. I think you'd mentioned the state has an interest. They can do it on a voluntary basis, not under the authority of the commission, but just under a lot of the relationships that we have around the table. That's, that's exactly what I was going to, to describe. You, you did a great job of it, is those states that do have an interest work together. Uh, do the do the necessary analysis and if uh if an aggregate of states believe that interstate management is the best way to address this then they can come back to this board uh present their findings and then we'll go from there how does that sound to everyone all right thanks thank you all for that 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 good discussion i know it's a it's always a tough tough thing to consider uh a need but uh, not necessarily have an easy way to address it so i appreciate the discussion and, and thank you david for 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 the motion we appreciate it all right so our next agenda item is an update on the follow-up addendum for the harvest control rule and that's tony thank you mr chairman and i failed to say um that on the back room there is some waterproof cards of um a, hard to identify mackerels and tunas that the Mid-Atlantic Council made with NOAA Fisheries and Julia um, reached out. So if anybody is interested in taking any of those cards home, uh, please do so. Um, so next up is the um, harvest control rule addendum and the recreational um, management measures amendment. In your briefing materials, there were uh, two timeline documents to these, if you wanna reference them while I go through the documents. Um, as you all know, we are working with the Mid-Atlantic Council on developing both of these management documents. The board and council are have a um, follow up to the harvest control rule addendum and framework. The boards um, directed the plan development team to further develop the percent change approach, including an F, a potential F based approach um, for that, as well as continuing developing the biological reference point approach and the biomass based matrix approach. Um, uh, and that the PDT should develop uh, measures using modeling or, uh, or other approaches for alternatives uh, for the biological reference points and the um, biomass matrix approach. Um, for the timeline for this addendum, the, the document that's on your briefing materials has many more parts of this listed, but I was trying to keep it simple here. Uh, today, we need to approve a plan development team that will work with the council's FMAT. This summer, we will begin to uh, develop the draft um, document itself. Um, and throughout the summer through next year, um, we'll do some back and forth with the board and council as the document is being developed. In August of next year, we will approve um, the document for public hearings. We'll have those hearings in the summer and fall. And then in April of 2025, we will take action. Um, and in the winter of 25, federal rulemaking would occur and hopefully have this document implemented by uh, 2026, which is the expiration date of the original harvest control rule addendum. We did receive um, some plan development team nominations. Uh, those were Mike Celestino, Rachel Sizak, Adam Nowalski, Corinne Truesdale, and Sam Truesdale. 
Um, so for PDTs, uh, it is rec uh, recommended or traditionally board members are not on plan development teams because of the um, perception that a board member would have two bites at the apple. You all are um, giving recommendations and direction to the plan development team to draft documents and then you're making the decision on the document. Um, and so for board members to be on PDTs, it has the appearance of developing the measures that you would be finalizing. Um, for this, because of this, we're recommending that we consider having a small working group made up of commissioners and council council members to advise the PDT when needed. Um, this document was pretty difficult to put together. Last time there were times when the PDT and FMAT probably could have used some advice from the board. Um, and so we would utilize this work group in that way if the PDT had some questions and they could go back to that small work group. Uh, staff is suggesting that Adam be placed on that work group instead of the PDT based on sort of the general rules and processes that we normally follow for PDTs and not having board members on them. But that is the decision of this board to make if you would prefer to have Adam on the PDT, then that is, you know, the decision you all can make today. Um, next slide, I'm just going to quickly go over the recommendment timeline. And again, this one is also greatly abbreviated um, from what is in your materials. But the recreational amendment is the amendment that looks at sector separation and recreational accountability. Uh, so this summer, I'll ask for PDT members for that, but I figured we'd get the other document out, out of the way first. And then in December of this year, uh, the FMAT and PDT will bring forward a scoping document for the council and board to approve. We would do scoping in the winter of 24, provide a review of the scoping and get direction to from the PDT and the FMAT to develop management measures for the amendment document. In the spring of 25, we would do um, uh, approve the public hearing document, have public hearings in the spring and summer of 25. Next slide. And then um, take final action in August of 25. Um, and then um, in this, oh, sorry. You can ignore those top ones. And then uh, in the winter of 26, the EA uh, would be developed and federal rulemaking would occur. And the implementation date is a little unknown since we don't know what the, um, the how much time we would need for that EA development um, from the council side of the process. It's not something that the commission does, but. So um, if you could go back to the PDT nomination slide, thanks. So today I'm just looking for approval of the PDT. Okay, uh, Shanna. Tony, if I may, I'm not sure. Um, so if the board decides that um, they'd move Adam to a commissioner or council uh, work group, Virginia did have intent to uh, nominate someone to this PDT. So I do have a replacement for you if, because four seems kind of sparse to me. Um, I'm, I think that email might not have come through, so apologies. But I just verified with my staff member who did want to be a part of this PDT if we need another person. Shana, we're happy to have another person. You can just tell us who it is and that person could be approved today. And it just as a, we were fine with this only being a smaller number because we are working with the FMAT as well. So it's a combined group. So we do have more than just these individuals. There'd be the, um, the Mid-Atlantic Council staff that are on the FMAT uh, and also no fisheries staff that include um, both policy and scientific, social, economic, um, the typical folks that you see on a FMAT. Uh, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a question about <clears throat> um, Adam, I guess, uh, here. Um, so just a personal comment for me. Adam is uh, very technically savvy, I think could be uh, totally fine on the PDT. I guess um, 
so I'm not sure if we need to make that explicitly in, in the sort of action that we take care of or keeping him in or um, if we want to move him. And if this other, if the little asterisk is a thing, um, I'd be interested in, in being on that group. Uh, so if there's some mechanism to um, jump on there, I'd, I'd be interested in that. Just, just to respond to that, Jason. Yeah, you know, the, the asterisk next to Adam's name, obviously, is nothing personal. Adam is great, very technically sound, and, and contributed a whole lot to the, the previous iterations of the Harvest Control Rule activities. Um, you know, it, it's the practice that the commission has been that if somebody's on a management board, we don't put them on plan development teams or technical committees or advisory panels just because they get kind of two shots at it. So, you know, it, it, nothing against Adam. And, and so, the idea of potentially setting up a working group or something else that interacts with the PDT is really to accommodate Adam and, and others that may be interested and have and that technical expertise. Because I, you know, if you if you recall the the last go around with Harvest Control Rule conversations and PDT, and you know, there was a lot of input from National Marine Fisheries Service and and board members and Mid Atlantic Council members and others that contributed to that group. You know, the PDT reacted to it and, and flushed out some of those ideas. Um, so. You know, I think continuing that sort of process where there's a, a group of super interested board and council members that can contribute, I think is a good process, but we may not want to sort of go against the practice of the commission of actually appointing board members to a PDT. So that's why I'm sure Adam's not here. So, I, you know, I'm sure he's listening, but I just don't want, I want him to think. He's, okay. I, I just don't want him to think, you know, we're, we're singling him out for any any reasons other than just his membership on the board. All right, I'm going to go to Jeff Bruss, and then uh, Adam actually has his hand up. So, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, get on record and say I, I, I totally understand the optics concern we have here with um, folks double dipping on technical committees and then boards. Uh, I do want to um, to reiterate the words of Jay Mack and um, Bob Beal, though, but Adam is definitely very savvy technically. Uh, we've had very good success working with him through some of these technical issues. So I, I certainly think that he will bring something to the table as he has already shown, as Bob already mentioned. Uh, I think not. I think it'd be hard for any of us here to disagree that Adam was pretty instrumental in getting us to the point <clears throat> that we are now with some of the options that we have on the table. And I know that he has some other ideas to, to continue carrying the ball down the field. So um, I would like to somehow get Adam involved in this, whatever the, the decision is. Um, I also, just a question of clarification, I guess, for Tony. I believe you said if we go with this working group that the PDT will connect with them as needed, which opens the opportunity for not at all. So is there a way that we can set up a schedule or some, some definitive act, interaction between these two groups so that there is the, the the direction and interaction that is, I believe, deserved. I think we could try to figure something out. I don't know if we need to figure that out right at this very moment. I didn't want to obligate that group to have to check in after every single meeting that they had, um, because that could be a lot of work on the PDT and the work group that is, that would, you know, mean double the meetings for the PDT perhaps, but, um, I think we could try to figure out what that needs to be, um, whether it's every other meeting that they can check in when they're, I mean, obviously when the PDT has questions and they're struggling to get direction on an issue, they would reach out for sure. Um, and if the board is directing them to look at other alternatives besides the ones that are identified in the motion, um, they may need to reach out to those board members that developed those different ideas to get better direction on those options as well. All right, I'm gonna go, I've got Adam on the line and then I've got Lynn and then Mike Ruscio and Justin. Great, thanks very much. So first off, um, let me uh, put my tissue away here, wiping the tear from the corner of my eye. Uh, appreciate all the kind words here today. Uh, 
I think I'm also flattered that I was put on this nomination list. I think the original request went out citing, uh, you know, council members uh, were appropriate, which I am presently, uh, as well as uh, previous experience with the percent change approach, um, which I had a lot of work doing. That being said, um, I think this approach of having a small commissioner council member group, uh, I am not alone in my contributions. Uh, I am not alone in my abilities. I think there are a number of people at both the council and the commission that sit around the table uh, that can contribute. Um, but I do think Jeff's comments about trying to find some more specific input points as opposed to uh, simply when needed uh, is what would really make this work. Uh, if the PDT was able and the FMAT was able to define, okay, you know, we don't have to check in with them. This isn't, you know, mom or dad checking your homework kind of thing. Uh, I think what we're looking for, because we know the options that came out of the last uh, work, uh, while they were certainly refined and worked on by the FMAT PDT, there were a number of individuals that were involved, including the service in submitting those originally. Uh, I suspect the continued development of those, those individuals, including myself, uh, would be willing participants to work on them, both from a conceptual as well as a technical nature. Uh, so I think I'd put that out there, that this group, if we could find a way to provide predefined input points, uh, I would uh, certainly think that's a reasonable way forward. And again, I appreciate all the kind words I've heard today. And sorry, I'm not there to personally thank you uh, looking in the eyes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. All right, Lynn, and then Mike Ruccio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, if for, it seems like sort of a convoluted workaround. You know, if we have a work group that's advising the PDT they, of commissioners, they still get two bites at the apple. So, I, I mean, maybe I'm not seeing it correctly, but it, maybe we just need to call it what it is, and maybe this is just a joint plan, de plan development team with um, commissioner council input because I mean for sure the input of, of people like Adam is going to be valuable nothing's going to go forward without you know being thoroughly discussed um, at the overarching management body so I don't know it just seems a little a little convoluted although I do understand the perception issues thanks all right Mike and then I'll go to Justin thank you, Mr. Chair I'll be quick um, Echo what others have said about Adam. He brings value to whatever groups he's involved with, and it's certainly nothing personal against him. But this this issue does tend to come up time and again. I think particularly with the service because our folks tend to do a little bit of everything. Um, I would really encourage, perhaps through this board and through the commission, to like tighten up the standard operating procedures for working group operations. Um, to have this explicit, it's it's very difficult when it, you know, is kind of the practice, but it's not written down, it would give it so much more backing to have these lines clearly delineated in one of the written documents so that when these issues come up, we don't have to have this one-off conversation. It's clear that if you're a seated board member, you can't participate in the PDT. You'll probably still be there, you'll probably contribute or things of those natures. So just encouragement to kind of decide how we want this to operate and then capture that in writing. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and sorry, Adam, I'm going to keep on here a little bit, but, you know, I having worked with Adam uh, when I was the vice chair of the Fluke Scup CVAS board and then now as the chair, there's nobody who is as familiar with the details of this process. He's been with it since the beginning. Um, it'd be a disservice to the commission if we don't find a way to have him involved with this. So um, I think this suggested approach, while it is admittedly sort of like a contrived workaround, maybe it, you know, will be an interesting experiment to try to have, you know, these PDTs working on these policy issues, but then having periodic input from board members in a focused, structured way. Uh, maybe that'll end up being valuable and would be something we want to do again in the future. So um, I would support the asterisk approach uh, here. All right, I think we're at the point where we need to take action on this. So we have we have basically two alternatives. We, we have a PDT nomination list that includes a board member, and we have an alternative that would be PDP members that doesn't include, but has the creation of a working group that would be populated with people that would uh, consult and advise and interact with the PDT to ensure that the PDT's products were, were the best they could be. 
So that's where we're at. So, yeah, I, John. Sorry, I was just going to ask whether you need a motion for, for this. Shanna, who is the person that you wanted to put on this list? Alexa Galvan. Okay. Um, can you put Alexa on there and I'll pretend to spell her name for you? Well, while she's doing that, we, 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 could, we could resolve this by if there's no opposition to using, I'll call it, as Justin said, the asterisk approach. If everybody's okay with that, then we don't necessarily need a motion per se. Um, we would accept the nominations to the PDT uh, with the asterisk, and then we will populate a work group with commission and council members that will interact with them in a yet to be determined manner to ensure again that there's some symmetry there and that the outputs um, are better than would be otherwise. How about that? Is that does that make sense to, to everybody? So is anybody opposed to that? Does everybody understand that? Okay. I don't see anyone opposed to it, Tony. So I'm going to, uh, for the record, say that that's what we're, policy board is supporting okay any last any confusion i want to make sure we're not going in, going to a place where nobody wants to go okay all right i see i see heads nodding okay all right very good all right thank you uh i think david you had your hand up you want to make a comment no no sir all right very good okay thank y'all um now we'll move on to something really easy uh <laughs> discuss the future of the mid-atlantic fishery management council's research set aside program all right thank you mr chair yeah i'm gonna try to summarize a program that's got about 20 years worth of history in in a few slides and brandon muffley is in the back of the room from the mid-atlantic council and he's my phone a friend for this whole meeting so if i need anything uh, I'll, I'll ask for brandon's help and, and a lot of these slides i actually plagiarized from the mid-atlantic council and put our background on it and, and i'm taking full credit for it so just so you guys know what i'm up to but now the research set aside program a little bit of history on it that most folks know um started in 2001 first research set aside activity and, and programs were funded in 2002 the species that asmc manages that are involved in that program are summer flounder scup black sea bass bluefish and dogfish um, the overall goal of this was to meet unaddressed research needs um, the, you know there's uh, a lot of research needs there's a long laundry list of research needs that uh, were unaddressed didn't have funding didn't have resources to conduct those science scientific work and Research set aside was developed to um, address those unaddressed needs. Um, the, the way it functionally worked was up to 3% of the overall quota could be set aside for each of these species in any given year. And that was agreed to by the Mid-Atlantic Council and ASMSC during a spec setting process. Um, so that, that amount would be taken off the top and then the, the remaining 97% or so was then divided based on the um, allocation formula that's in the FMP. <laughs> Um, the overall goal is frankly just to convert fish into funding. So the, you know, obviously that 3% of the, or up to 3% of the quota had a value and those fish were, um, turned into cash in two different ways. One is, um, and both through what's called compensation fishing. One is, um, a PI and a vessel, a, a primary or principal investigator and a vessel, uh, develop an arrangement to say test the gear. So if, uh, a vessel or, or a principal investigator wanted to, try a new net configuration or mesh size or something along the way, they would obviously catch some of those species in as part of that uh, research activity. They would keep those that what they caught and sell it. And selling those fish would then generate income to offset the expenses of conducting that research. And the second approach was a third party auction where a principal investigator would be uh, allocated a certain quota of one of these species or multiple species. That quota would then go out to auction. Um, commercial, in the old iteration, the commercial and or for hire um, captains uh, could purchase that 
quota and that the purchase of that quota then generated the revenue the revenue then funded and supported the research um, the the previous iteration commercial as i mentioned commercial and four higher vessels were both involved um, state and federal vessels were involved um, it, this program averaged about uh, one a little over a million one to two million two million in the highest years um, dollars per year were generated so quite a bit of money was generated with this program historically um, in 2014 there are 103 vessels and two more than 2,000 trips involved with this program and I'll talk about that the cumbersome um, difficulty of managing that many vessels and that many trips um, a little bit later but um, you know that's that's an important highlight how much how many people and how many uh, trips were involved one of the big things that this overall program funded historically was the NEMAP survey uh, NEMAP survey wouldn't have been able to get up and running without the funding that, that came out of the RSA program and that program is now funded through money directly from National Marine Fisheries Service to um, no, it moves through ASMOC, but it ultimately ends up at the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. Um, here's the overall you know, process. There's the Mid-Atlantic Council, NOAA Fisheries, and the states all have different responsibilities within the, the um, overall program of the RSA. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council creates the program, sets the priorities, does a proposal review. The federal government has the, the grant administration, project selection, oversight, um, technical support, compensation, fishing, permitting, et cetera. And this part is where the states come in, the, the right-hand column, which is really important and a, and a pretty significant amount of work, and that's why we're having this conversation, is the dockside enforcement, compensation, fishing, permitting, and administration for all the vessels that are going to land in an individual state, and then quota monitoring, reporting, and reconciliation if anyone goes over their quotas. And this is, again, a, 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 a principal investigator could have gotten a large, say, 10,000 pounds of summer flounder. That 10,000 pounds could have been divided up into smaller allotments through the uh, auction process, and those that, that 10,000 pounds could have been spread across you know, 10, 15, 20 vessels, depending on how they uh, divvied up the quotas. Uh, so there is quite a bit of burden under the uh, in this program on the states. Um, and that's what, toward the end, that's gonna be the questions back to the policy board. Um, this is kind of a, a figure highlighting that not all species are created equal or have equal value. You know, summer flounder and black sea bass are really where the money comes from in this program. There's, as I mentioned, a lot of other species involved, but they don't, they just don't have the value um, that, um, you know, those two species have. So that, that's where the, the revenue is coming from. Um, program strengths. The, the previous program had a lot of strengths and a lot of value. Um, you know, this, it, it did provide uh, funding for high priority research. Um, and really, there were no federal dollars involved. There was federal activity involved with the administration of the program and no federal dollars supporting that research. Um, and it ultimately allowed managers to be involved with the decision process on what research gets carried out, gets fishermen and researchers working together, uh, created some more trust between the industry and the, and the, um, the PIs and, and scientists. And it gave NOAA an opportunity to work with managers and, and the fleet to solve a number of problems that they had. However, there were some, some issues with the previous iteration of this program. And um, as, you, as you'll notice, this, has, this slide has, a little, has, has more words on it than the last slide, which is uh, there, there were more concerns than strengths uh, in a lot of people's minds. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, large administrative and enforcement costs uh, that weren't, weren't expected initially, and some of that came in, or evolved over time, given the burden and the number of vessels that were involved in this fishery. Um, the value of fishing opportunities, as I talked about earlier, you know, there's a couple species that really generated the revenue here. Um, you know, foregoing 3% of the, the harvest does have a lot of this cost of the industry. Um, you know, while no federal dollars are involved, it really worked out to folks that participate in this fishery, sacrifice some of their fishing opportunities and, and funded the research indirectly. Um, Enforcement, there are a number of enforcement issues. Uh, there are financial incentives not to report trips. Trips came in, if nobody was at the dock, they kind of went and were sold and away they went and weren't counted against RSA. A number of instances uh, like that were, were noticed and, and folks were caught. And, and this really led to potentially overfishing. So, you know, if, if trips are being landed, no one's accounting for them, not counting against the quotas, there you know, overfishing is resulting. Recreational landings reporting is not verifiable. They didn't have anyone necessarily at the dock to catch every recreational trip that's coming back and, and verify their catch. Um, 
And then, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, capacity to monitor the 103 vessels in 2000 trips in one year is, it was very limited at the state level and put a lot of burden on the states. And it took a lot of permitting to get, uh, allow those folks to go out and do their work. Um, and the research had some problems as well, you know, failed peer reviews for some of the projects, the application and, you know, were some of the projects weren't that useful for management, weren't plugged directly into management and limited number of groups and, and um, you know, applied for this funding. And ultimately, all of this concerns and issues with the program led to the cancellation or suspension of the program in 2015. And that's where we are now. It's still suspended and no activities going on. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Council over the last couple of years has put a lot of time and effort into this, looking at you know what would rede redevelopment look like. Um, they've held four workshops, um, industry workshops, and those were all virtual because of uh, COVID. The Mid-Atlantic Council's Research Steering Committee has met at least three times that I know of. They had their SSC's Economic Working Group involved and, and uh, provided some feedback as well. Um, the the RSA framework was developed through the research steering committee in these workshops, and they developed expanded goals for administration, enforcement, funding, and research are all the key elements of this program. Um, and here's kind of what, where the commission is involved. Are you on this one? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> one more. There you go. That's right. Um, and then, you know, the here's where the commission comes in, in into play and what what do we want to what message and what, what are your thoughts collectively on where we go from here? Um, the new framework that has been developed and kind of there now is an old system and a new system that's kind of described in, in the briefing materials that went out to the board. There were there's a table with two columns in it, old versus new. And in that table, there's a number of things that will fall to the states potentially for states to address and reconcile. And um, <clears throat> It, they're kind of in the red text that's up here, vessel and sector participation. So who, how many vessels can be involved? Is it, you know, is 103 too many? Is that a reasonable number? Should it just be 10 vessels? Uh, what sectors? Is it for hire and commercial or is it just one or the other? Um, are there, are there, you know, state and federal permit holders? Can they all be uh, included and participate? Is there a phase in option where you start small and go bigger over time as we deal with enforcement issues? Um, do you want to limit the location of where landings can occur, time of the day where they are, certain dealers that can be involved in this? Just to, these are all things to narrow down the complexity of the program and um, you know make it more enforceable and take out some of the loopholes and, and shenanigans that were going on last go around. Um, you know the the notion of bring putting staff state staff on on um, on vessels as, as observers came up. Um, third party auction. There was some a suggestion that maybe ASMSC is a good group to administer that third party, which is a pretty significant amount of work. Um, the last bullet there. You know the greater the restrictions that are put on this program. That equals less participation. Less participation equals less funding generated. If you have fewer people bidding or, or interested, you're going to generate less income. Um, so you know that diminishes the value of the program overall. Um, the research steering committee of the council came up with a, a consensus conditional recommendation. There, you know, the value of the program, or you know, the the recommendation recognized the value of the program to produce science. And a lot of work remains still remains to be done and details need to be addressed. And then the final one is really where the commission comes in, you know, concerns about state administration, burden and the cost benefit of the program. And this is my final slide, which is, you know, what what feedback does this group want to provide to the Mid-Atlantic Council um, on where to go from here? You know, should the commission support uh, continued RSA redevelopment? Um, Again, there's a lot of work ahead. Um, are there other recommendations and feedback to the Mid-Atlantic Council? If the commission says, yes, let's continue redevelopment, or we support that, you know, certain species, or there's only certain sectors, what are the funding options with the third-party auction or not the third-party auction? And uh, how does this group want to engage with the Mid-Atlantic Council? So I know that's a whole lot of questions. This group's talked about the research set aside in the past, but, you know, the, the Mid-Atlantic Council is going to revisit this issue at their June meeting. And I think they're looking for pretty direct feedback on what the commission thinks and what the state's ability is to address all of these administrative and enforcement uh, issues and burdens that will be placed on them should this process go forward. So happy to answer any questions. I know that was kind of a, a lightning round of stuff for research set asides, but there's you know there's a lot here, and, and the council is looking for some for some help.
All right, let's start off with Emerson, then I'll go to Dan, and then Lynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have any questions, but if it's appropriate at this time, I'd like to make some comments. Okay. Thank you. So, um, you know, I was involved significantly in the old RSA program, uh, and I continue to be involved in the Monkfish RSA program. And I conducted four Mid-Atlantic RSA projects. Um, that were all um, very successful, provided good information for management. And for most of those, um, I just worked with vessels directly, right? So in terms of one of the slides, less participation equals less revenue. That's not necessarily true. I worked with a small number of vessels each time, 10 to 12 vessels, and were able to work out things to get um, a market value. Um, uh, uh, for those compensation landings. In any event, um, redevelopment is not going to look like the past program, right? It, it can't. That's why um, the workshops were held. I participated in those workshops um, to, so that a new program does not look like and does not have the problems of the old program. So I would ask when you think about RSA, don't think about the old program um, other, other than what were the issues that need to be changed and addressed, right? And, and, and that's what the, the uh, workshop um, was going through um, and developing, and it still needs to be developed. And um, the output from the um, workshops, um, Bob, you didn't have a slide on it, but you referenced it. So it's in our meeting materials. Under goal two is to ensure effective monitoring, accountability, and enforcement of RSA quota. And that goal addresses most of the, pro not all, but most of the problems that came up during the, uh, the previous RSA program. So that's being addressed. And if you look at the objectives in there, um, some of that is to provide support for administrative and law enforcement activities at the states, to improve the state's ability to revoke RSA fishing privileges, and several other things as well to, to assist the states. So that gets at, at a lot of those um, specific issues. So I, I guess the bottom line is um, a new a newly developed RSA program is not going to look like the old program. It's not going to have the problems of the old program. Um, otherwise, why is the research steering committee going through that? They, they realize that, uh, that they need to address those problems. And I'm not sure where you want to go with this, um, Mr. Chairman, but um, if you want a motion, I'm prepared to make a motion at some point here. Thank you. I think at this point, the uh, office is seeking feedback from as many uh, interested parties or potentially participating parties about their perspective on their ability to achieve success, I guess, with this. So uh, just hold on your motion and uh, we'll we'll see what else folks have to say. So Dan, and then I'm going to go to Lynn. Yeah, thanks. Um, my off. concern is I, I don't think we have enough time to actually cover this topic in what's time remaining. Um, I participated in all those workshops and I raised a lot of concerns. I personally don't know what the, the uh, research set aside committee is thinking in terms of what recommendations or what concerns we had that, that they're going to heed. The, 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 many of them are simple that the, the the idea of selling fish to for higher vessels um, was a colossal mistake, and it was completely unenforceable. And uh, the the um, the currency is incompatible. Uh, for higher trips work on bag limits and size limits, and suddenly you had poundage, and it was completely unmanageable. As far as the uh, the auctions to you know multitudes of vessels, it put a lot of burden on us. And, and I would say that the Mid Atlantic Council gave the states the fluke fishery, the sea bass fishery, the summer scup fishery. And, and it's, it, it's, I don't think it's possible. I think the success in RSA is when the federal government has, has a very simple permitting scheme and a very simple you know, letter of authorization scheme where you can manage and monitor this. 
you can't effectively manage and monitor this when you've got scores and scores of, of boats trying to capitalize on this. So the the and and also the the summer flounder isn't worth what it was. The, you know, Emerson's right in a lot of ways. Um, the money isn't there on fluke that used to be there, and and nor on sea bass. So um, with these quotas being so high, I would like to see maybe this continued until the August meeting or maybe a special conference call or something, because I don't know what the Mid-Atlantic Council is thinking. All right, I think that's a good point. And we are we are getting tight on time. And if this is a, a subject that is much more complex than our ability to have the kind of discussion we need, then, then maybe that is something we need to contemplate. How does that work? So I'll let you. I'm in from the meeting and ask them what their timeline is. What yeah, Brandon, would you kind of maybe give us a little idea on the, the MIS timeline on this, maybe help uh, inform our discussions on this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Brandon Muffley, Mid-Atlantic Council staff. I mean, we don't have a specific timeline. It's, it's actually not going to be on our June council meeting. We thought we might put it on our August council meeting since we tend to meet jointly with the commission. It's not with the policy board at that time, but at least you know, a number of commission folks may be at that meeting. So we were thinking about bringing an update back to the to the council at that time. You know, I think we, particularly me as the person sort of overseeing how we may redevelop the program, is understanding where the states are. As, as Bob had pointed out, you all play a critical role in the sort of operationalization of the RSA program and where you all are at in regards to supporting either the continued work to redevelop it or not. Uh, it takes a lot of work. Garfo hasn't had an RSA program to administer in the mid-Atlantic for several years now, so there's going to be a lot of sort of thinking through how we develop this program to make sure we can do it successfully. But if the states aren't willing to support the program and sort of commit the resources, because there are going to be a lot of resources to do it, it's challenging to sort of step through all of that work that's going to need to be done. So, you know, getting your feedback in regards to where you are at with the program, I think would be really helpful. And like I said, I think the plan is to bring it to the August council meeting where, where the, where you all may be there. All right, thanks, Brandon. Um, just a comment, and then I'll go back to the list here. As I was just talking to Bob, maybe, maybe, uh, as Dan suggested, maybe a webinar between now and the August meeting where the states that are directly affected by this have a chance to more thoroughly discuss this, understand it, prepare them to have us to have a broader discussion at the August meeting, if that sounds like a reasonable course of action, because we don't need to give this short, short shift. Uh, but we are, we are running out of time. And I think, as Brandon said, I think we all. This is very complicated. There's a lot of moving parts, and if the states can't fulfill uh, their part of the relationship, then it's doomed to failure before it ever starts again. So I think it's going to be important that we give this the attention it needs. So with that, I'll go uh, to Lynn and then to Tom and then back to j -Mac. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I sure would like to learn more about this. And Brandon answered some of my questions. You know, the state of Maryland, I have no idea where we would find resources for something like this. It's just conceivable to me. And I'm, I'm not sure I understand the mechanism. If there's, you know, if, would the states be voluntarily participating or would a research set aside program happen that was determined by somebody that it was going to happen and then suddenly we would be committed you know um without without really having much of a choice so uh, you know the resources is going to be tough and the resources put up against the benefit is something we would have to look really hard at all right, thanks, Lynn. And, and just for those that are, that are virtual, I just want to make it clear we're, we're not going to take any public comment on this particular topic unless we do have a motion. And I don't think we're moving in the direction of a, a motion at this point. Uh, so, Tom, uh, and then I'll go to J Matt. Oops, damn. Sorry about that. I've done that once before, also spilled water on my computer. Um, I have concerns. I mean, I looked at it the last time we did it, um, and we were in more robust times. We basically we had extra poundage, and now when you take three percent or four percent or whatever you do take from the 
from the stock. It means days at sea for a lot of the um, recreational sector. And same thing with the commercial sectors. And there was not a lot of support in the com and recreational community after the debacles that are going on there. I haven't paid much attention to it, so I'd be interested in being better informed on it. But I have real concerns over it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be quick because it sounds like we're maybe going to come back to this, so I'll save the majority of my comments for that. But just uh, maybe I'll give you the highest level comment to say I'm more optimistic than most of the comments that you heard uh, here. So, you know, I would be, I saw the value um, of the program in our state. Um, respectfully disagree with uh, Dan um, on the, the recreational pile, at least the one that I know that that happened. Um, so, you know, I just see, I see value in it. <clears throat> I do. I also felt the burden, the administrative burden. So I'd like to see those things get sorted out um, as well. So I'm, I'm interested in continuing the, the conversation um, and maybe could offer a different perspective to it. All right. So I think, you know, plan moving forward to be to try to organize a webinar, provide adequate time for this to be more thoroughly discussed, uh, questions asked, more clarity, and then uh, we can bring this back to the policy board uh, at the August meeting, if that's satisfactory to everybody. That seem okay? I don't see anybody vigorously shaking their head no, so I'm going to assume that's good. Okay, thank y'all. All right, next um, we've got uh, Dr. Drew with an assessment science committee report. Great, thanks. Um, so the assessment science committee report, uh, sorry, assessment science committee met last month to discuss a number of things, but um, the most important relevant for this board is, um, next slide, the assessment schedule. Current benchmark schedule, we have eight benchmark as uh, assessments scheduled for between 2023 and 2025, which are circled in red on this schedule. We're not even counting the ones that um, the Northeast Fishery Science Center um, and the Southeast Fishery Science Center are doing, even though some of our technical committees do, uh, members do participate on work groups. So there are a lot of benchmark assessments scheduled uh, for the next three years. And um, next slide, we also have six assessment updates scheduled for this time. Um, and so this does not even include the number of sort of additional follow-up tasks that are going on for eel and horseshoe crab um, and striped bass in between these assessments. So the workload over the next few years is pretty intense uh, from the stock assessment side. And so the um, stock assessment, the assessment committee recommended some changes to this schedule in order to help balance some of the workload. So um, next slide. The two key things we're highlighting here that would need to be approved by the policy board would be to change the sturgeon and menhaden single species assessments um, that are currently down as benchmarks to assessment updates. Next slide. So menhaden board already got this uh, information um, and we're basically fine with it. So for Menhaden, there are no changes to the model planned. The single species model, the BAM, is a solid, well-developed model that's been peer reviewed multiple times, identified any new data sources. So we're not planning any new changes to the data or to the model that would warrant a benchmark. And doing an update instead of a benchmark would reduce the workload for the TC and SAS, um, who overlap significantly with the ERP work group, as well as staff and the peer review panel, who last time specifically asked that we not, um, because it, it's a lot of work to produce that and to review that. Um, and by going to an update, it would free more time and energy to be directed towards the ERP. And the ERP assessment would remain a benchmark. Next slide. So Sturgeon, um, the 2017 benchmark assessment recommended an update in five years and a benchmark in 10 years. So we had it on the 2022 schedule and that got postponed. So we're kind of in between the timeline for an update and a benchmark right now. And the TC, after reviewing the research recommendations and progress on, on those, recommended doing an update in 2024 to allow more time projects um, to be completed. 
Uh, so we would do an update this year, um, spilling into finishing next year. And the TC would sort of recommend when we would do a benchmark based on the um, status of those research projects and how the update went at the end of that. So those are the two major changes that would need to be approved by the policy board. Um, I'm also gonna highlight something that ASC did not talk about, but um, the board should probably be aware of, which is that the river herring assessment, which is ongoing right now, the SAS recommended pushing the completion of that assessment back basically one meeting cycle. Um, originally, we were going to try to get it peer reviewed in August of this year and presented to the board um, <clears throat> at annual meeting in October of this year. But based on sort of progress, um, we would like to now have this peer reviewed in late November, early December um, and presented to the board in February. So ideally, it would still be peer reviewed and completed in 2023, but the board would not receive the results until 2024. Um, the River Herring Board is not meeting uh, this meeting cycle, so we want to provide an update to the coastwide board of the policy board um, just to get that on everybody's records. But the bigger change is, um, sorry, next slide, um, is the uh, the change to the sturgeon and the menhaden going from a benchmark to an update for those. So thanks, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Just a quick question. Just just curious of the thinking on on Tautog. I, I see that it's identified for an update in twenty four, uh, but it's uh, it's it's it might not be updated in twenty four. I don't see anything else scheduled through thirty for it. And, and and my recollection is it just sort of squeaked through in a couple of regions of getting out of overfished at the last update. Yeah, so I'll be honest, when we talked, brought this to ASC and the workload issue, we didn't even count to TOG because it only has a little asterisk there on that schedule. And honestly, we, we so I think the, um, so we weren't even thinking about that as something to contribute to this workload issue. Obviously, it would be additional work. Um, and the thing about Chautauqua is it's actually four stock assessments because it is four regions. So um, ASC did not specifically talk about this. Um, I would imagine that sort of the recommendation would be not to add any more assessments to the next two to three years. Um, I think, you know, we could definitely come back to that in 2026 um, and do a update of that at that point. But I think that would probably be something we'd have to schedule in the future um, in a few years to to get that on the on the schedule without overburdening everybody else. Uh, but it's definitely something I think on our current radar for a future that we want to make sure we don't let that slide too far. All right, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I mean, th th at this point, we spent a lot of time talking about modifying gear and maybe time area closures for Atlantic sturgeon. So, what would any change in the timeline for Atlantic sturgeon do to those pending regulations? So, um, the <clears throat> We're still going to complete, excuse me, the update next. <coughs> excuse me. We're still going to complete the update next year. Um, I think the the um, so we would have some information, in, updated information on abundance and mortality, trends in abundance and mortality. Um, I think it should not. Well, I don't want to speak to to that group in terms of whether that aligns or not, um, but. I don't think doing a benchmark would necessarily provide any more different information than an update would at this point. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions? All right. We just need to approve the schedule. Okay, so what we need now is, is board approval of the schedule uh, as presented by Dr. Drew. So, Tom Fody. All right, we have a motion by Tom, second by Mel Bell. Any discussion, Justin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. By approving this motion, this isn't the issue of the Tautog stock assessment is still unresolved as to when that will next happen. 
So, yeah, it's still going to get the little asterisk, which is sort of like scheduled but not official. If the board would like to make a recommendation on that, I think they could um, to officially take it off or bump it to another year. But um, ASC has not dealt with that. We could come back to that. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any opposition? Any further discussion on the motion? Any opposition to the motion? Um, seeing none, anybody online opposed? All right, no opposition, so motion carries. So, thank you. Okay. All right, next up, we got uh, Kurt Blanchard to give us a report from the law enforcement committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The following is a report on the activity of the law enforcement committee since the last reporting period. The LEC has been successful in and have participated in the following deliberations. We have worked with Ms. Tony Kearns on implementing a new membership orientation process with replacement of four committee members. We have conducted outreach to the new members with guidance on the roles and responsibilities of the LEC. We received very positive feedback on this effort. We have participated in discussions in reference to the current to tag, tagging study, as well as collaborating with the Stripe Bass Plan Review Team with new law enforcement compliance reporting language. The LEC convened a business meeting on May 2nd, 2023 to address the following topics. We conducted a review and update of the guidelines for resource managers on the enforceability of fisheries management measures dated August, 2015. This review, this review by the LEC helped to identify new management measures as well as considering the relevance of previous management measures. The LEC established a subcommittee to finalize this document and the goal is to forward the final draft to this board for approval in 2023. The LEC received an update from the ACCSP on the status and implementation of the VMS program in the American lobster fishery, as well as receiving a presentation about, and this is gonna be a mouthful, National Association of Conservation Law Enforcement Leadership Academy and the International Conservation Chiefs Academy Wildlife Officer Exchange Program. This program is of interest as the chair of the LEC was invited to participate in this program in his role as a state officer and a NACLEA graduate. The exchange was with the ICCA graduate from the Fisheries and Compliance and Enforcement Agency of Belize. This shared experience helped to increase international collaboration and individual capacity to address wildlife crimes globally. This next section is some notable cases. Um, in the past, I've been asked a number of times that people want to know what law enforcement's doing and, and they never hear back from us in occasional reports. So I just wanted to highlight a few. Uh, the first is, is one you saw last night in the annual was of Excellence. It was the state of New York with the seasonal striped bass pulse operation over three years along the Hudson River during the annual migration. The second is a NOAA U.S. Coast Guard conducting enhanced enforcement of the right whale speed rule with state law enforcement partners along the Atlantic coast and as well as the South Carolina, this is this is a this is a cute one. Uh, I shouldn't say cute, but uh, <laughs> Operation Sea Fluke, catchy name. This is the Southeastern Area Flounder Liberation from Unlawful Killing and Exploitation. This was a wide-ranging investigation into the illegal commercial harvest and sale of flounder and other saltwater finfish species. This three-month investigation led to over forty-eight thousand dollars in fines against four separate offenders with additional license sanctions. Mr. Chair, thank you, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Kurt. Any questions for Kurt? Tom? One of the questions I, I'd like to ask is, we passed an emergency action yesterday on Stripe Bass. That will basically be um, 180 days, so we have to change the regulation for 180 days, and if we don't renew it, it would basically go back to uh, the regulations, and I asked my law enforcement about it, and I guess we should have asked the law enforcement committee what enforcement problems you'll be having, and I'd like to have a report on that maybe at the next meeting so we could discuss the concerns with there. I think it's important. I, From the wording I got from my uh, the head of my, uh, New Jersey law enforcement was not happy on this. And says we, you know, it's almost impossible. All our regulations have been published, and they're out in the, in the Jersey Registry and in the, uh, in, the in the state documents. 
we'd be happy to review that. Um, we have similar concerns, and, and we're going to have to wait and see how the next 180 days goes and, and what uh, the real impact is to law enforcement. All right. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, Kurt. All right. Next, uh, we're going to get a brief update on East Coast Climate Change Scenario Planning Initiative. In the interest of time, I will go very fast. Uh, uh, we did have the summit meeting back in February for the East Coast Climate Change Scenario Planning, uh, which is looking at how climate change is affecting our management of the Atlantic coastal fisheries. This meeting is with all of the three councils as well as the Commission and NOAA Fisheries. We have the core team has written a report about the meeting and then we have pulled together a list of potential actions that will be reviewed by the Northeast Regional Coordinating Council next week. Um, and those potential actions um, try to list out different ideas that came up at the workshops, as well as other ideas that we heard from both the commissions and the councils. And the NRCC will kind of give us some direction on that um, draft action plan. And then at the August meeting, I will have a very thorough report on that draft action plan, the summit, and the direction that the NRCC is giving. All right, thanks, Tony. Any questions for Tony on that? Yes, sir, Senator Waters. Yeah, I wanted to thank uh, all for the great work on this. And um, just speaking as a legislator and given the timing of the August meeting that you're going to have, has there been any thought to what interface that you might have in terms of the policy issues that arise and potential legislation that legislators would have to introduce in their individual states? So for any of the possible actions that could need legislative changes, and most of those are legislative changes to the Magnuson-Stevens Act, those are sort of issues that the core team has identified to say this may have a a long-term change needed. Um, and so that's what we've sort of pointed out to this in this draft action plan um, and that the NRCC would need to think about and discuss those and then give better direction. I mean, and the NRCC is not a decision-making body. Any potential actions that move forward need to go to the commission, the council and NOAA Fisheries um, to make those uh, decisions on, um, but it'll, it, it, so it'll kind of have advice that way. All right. Any other questions for Tony? All right. Seeing none, we'll move along. We did not have any non-compliance findings, thankfully. Uh, we do have uh, three other business items, and hopefully we can dispense with it quickly. One is uh, related to lobster. So I'm going to let Tony explain that. I'll pass it over to Jason as the Lobster Board Chair to read the motion that the Lobster Board made to the Policy Board. Okay, um, <clears throat> so to, to read the motion uh, into the record here on behalf of, no, that's not it. All right, we'll, uh, we'll hold off on that a minute while that gets disentangled. So I'm going to call on Jim, uh, Jim Gilmore. New York is still um, experiencing um, an issue with our tag tagging program, which I think we talked about back at the October meeting. Um, specifically, we're still getting reports of 10 to 25 percent mortality, uh, lesions, um, you know, um, damage to the fish, whatever. So, um, but obviously, this seems to be a, mostly a problem in New York. So, going forward, we uh, we've got survey information that we've done with the help of the commission. We're relooking at the data. Is it a capacity issue with the storage tanks, is it a water quality issue, it's those types of things. The other, but the one thing that we wanted to bring up is that um, we are going to uh, reevaluate the tags. Um, the original study was done through SUNY Stony Brook. The commission's helping with that, um, but the one question that I wanted to raise is under the guidance, um, it required a percula tag, um, and uh, we're going to look at other options on a tag that may not be an percolate tag. So the states that are currently in the tagging program, 
we wanted to raise this. Is there any issue with that? Because uh, if it turns out it is a tagging problem, that can change things. So question right now is, again, is there um, any ob objection or any issue with us pursuing a non-opercular tag? And I'll leave it at that. And Tony may follow up with a little bit more detail because uh, probably missed some things. And the it's the TOTOG has guidelines for what type of tag to use and where the tag should be put in the fish. So the state is just asking to put the tag somewhere else for just this year, but it's still using the same tag. And the TC is going to discuss whether or not it would be effective to put it somewhere else, making sure that it doesn't damage the fish. Um, and that is the the reason for the ask is the damage that the tag is currently doing um, as reported by some uh, New York fishermen. All right, so response to that, concerns about what New York's proposing to do, Bill? Just a question, because I'm not sure I'm hearing this correctly. Is the is the ask to do an evaluation of tags in different, different type of tags in different locations, or is the ask to implement the program differently? The ask is to implement the program differently. And just as a reminder, the guidelines are recommendations. They're not requirements. So. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly a comment on this. I, I think it was, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, we sort of asked some questions of the law enforcement committee about this program and they gave us some feedback and um, I mean, maybe this is a better discussion at the Tautog board, but I'd be interested in going back to the law enforcement committee a few years later here and essentially asking how has this program aided with enforcement? Because the intent of this program was to, you know, assist in, in cutting down on unlawful Tautog harvest. I think it was well intentioned. I would like to learn now that we've implemented it for some number of years that it's doing some good and it's assisting enforcement. If we find out that it's not, I think this program is placing an administrative burden on agencies, certainly on my program, which is very short staffed. Um, and, you know, I just feel like if this program is not serving the intended purpose, can we find out if there's ways to modify it so it could? Or should we decide that it was a well intentioned effort, but it didn't work out the way we thought it would and abandon it? So uh, I, don't, I don't know how it would be most appropriate to reach out to the law enforcement committee and ask for that input. Uh, the TOTOG board will receive a review of the program uh, again in August, and so we can make sure that we have another discussion with law enforcement prior to specifically asking if they have seen better compliance. All right, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear from New York law enforcement because I think the state of New York is sort of the hub of all uh, much of the TOTOG uh, distribution, you know, in, in commerce of live fish. And so I'd be really curious to hear, you know, their take because they're going to have to inspect fish from many states. And if, and if one state deviates um, from the location of the tag, if it's not a problem for New York law enforcement, then I'd, I'd feel more comfortable about it. I think we can try to do that, Dan. And as a reminder, this program was put in place because of the large volume of black market fish that were being put into um, the market by recreational fishermen, um, not the commercial fishermen. And so we were trying to find a way to prevent those recreational fish making it into the commercial market. All right, Jay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I like those suggestions here to kind of check back in because I'm, I'm not super comfortable otherwise i mean we there was a lot of effort that were put in to this particular tag um you know i think other tags were considered and, and this one is what we kind of defaulted to but as long as things are happening in an organized way uh and we're getting you know feedback i'm comfortable kind of moving forward here but um not otherwise all right so again your question answered. <laughs> okay. All right. Sometimes it's kind of hard to discern whether the question gets answered, isn't it? All right. Thank you for that. All right. Um, going to go back to Tony on uh, to Jay on the lobster. That that one looks right. 
Uh, okay. So um, I'll read the, the motion uh, into the record for uh, the board. On behalf of the American Lobster Board, we would recommend to the ISFMP Policy Board to approve their creation of a subcommittee to engage Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans to discuss transboundary issues related to the importation of lobster as it relates to the different minimum gauge sizes in the two countries. The subcommittee shall be made up of uh, four members of the Lobster Management Board who have license holders that fish in Area 1 and or Area 3, one representative from the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Commission's Executive Director or his designee. All right, this is a, a board motion, so it doesn't need a second. So we can have discussion on it. Uh, Mike, I saw your hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The past 48 hours has been a flurry of activity on how to best engage with our northern counterparts. So I have a substitute motion to offer if that would be appropriate at this juncture. Okay. So I, as well, will read this into the record, and then uh, if we need a second on this and I get one, then I'll, I'll give some rationale for it. So this is a motion to substitute to request the policy board create a subcommittee to be made up of up to four members of the American Lobster Management Board who have license holders that fish LCMA 1 and or 3, and at least one representative from the National Marine Fisheries Service and the commissioner's executive director, the commission's executive director or his designee. The subcommittee, prior to the engagement with parties in Canada who have an interest in lobster management and commerce, shall discuss and develop an approach on how best to find solutions that would be beneficial to both the sustainability of the lobster stock and commerce between the countries. All right, so we have a motion. This does need a second. So we have a second from Pat Kelleher. All right, all right. Discussion on the motion, questions on the motion? Sharif, question? Seconding? All right, very good. All right, Mike. Thank you. I'll just give some very brief rationale because I know we're, we're pressed for time. So the, the, the challenge is there is clearly a need to have these conversations with Canada. Being frank, I think it's in Canada's best interest to have these conversations with us. And, and the way the previous wording was suggestive that the commission and or states would directly engage with DFO. Well, that's not an absolute breach of protocol. Typically, the preference is for federal level conversations between National Marine Fisheries Service and DFO. So this would keep basically that same intent, have a small group to talk about, you know, what, what is it that we want to talk about? How do we message this through? And there are varying levels that that can occur with. My suggestion would be that we, we work with the greater, greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office as they're on point with management of lobster. They can speak directly with DFO at the behest of the commission and the states that are interested in this issue. If for whatever reasons that is unsuccessful in terms of Canada not engaging fully, we have a more formal um, bilateral agreement with Canada, meet regularly with them at a, at a kind of higher level of government engagement. And so there's you know varying degrees. Uh, my preference would be that as the committee works Hopefully they can find kind of the lowest level at which to have these conversations and, and try to forge out some conversations. But there are other options that move through and escalate all the way up to Department of State. So um, I think that's all that, you know, the work the subcommittee can do, but uh, wanted to kind of tweak the language so that we're, we're trying to preserve the process and kind of the decorum that we've typically had in communications with our counterparts at the federal level in Canada. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions, Pat? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to thank Mike Ruscio for working with me yesterday uh, to refine um, this language, uh, and I appreciate uh, the partnership and uh, from from him and his counterparts to try to find a way forward on this issue. This is incredibly critically important. Uh, conversations that need to happen. Um, I, I was prepared to just work with uh, the states to engage, but I do as a I do think it's important that National Marine Fisheries Service is part of this conversation, um, and hopefully we can do this in a way that keeps the State Department out of this conversation. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much. All right, any other questions or discussion on the motion? Any opposition? Uh, Jeff? Thank you very much. Just a question on, on uh, authority here, what, what the subcommittee's authority is. 
we're asking them to develop an approach and then are we leaving it to them to determine that are we giving them the discretion to determine that that approach is appropriate or does it come back to policy board or the lobster board and then regardless of that answer are we also giving them once that approach is developed are we then allowing them to engage with canada or does is that a separate action thank you I can't answer that, so somebody else better. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. a lot of finger pointing going on. It doesn't bode well, does it? <laughs> so, uh, somebody. If, if I may, Mr. Chair, I'm not opposed to this. I just yeah, want to make sure we know. No, it's a, it's a good question. I think it's relevant. What authority that's just, uh, has. And I think it's important. So, Mr. Kelleher. Yeah, thank Mr. Chairman. So, um, with all subcommittees, they usually report back to the board and policy board. So, um, that certainly would be the intent of the action here. Um, I think because this committee is um, uh, going to engage with Canada, that's why I thought it was important to include the Commission's Executive Director uh, or as a designee as part of this to flag any issues that uh, he thought would be important to come back to this policy board before any action was taken. So I was, while not explicit, I was trying to create those safeguards that would address your, uh, address those issues. I got you. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion, questions? Any opposition to the motion? Seeing none, motion passes by unanimous consent. All right, thanks. All right, one last thing, uh, transfer letters. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to make this super fast because I'm starting to get into hangry territory. Um, <laughs> I uh, have been doing a lot of transfer letters. I think I know a lot of us have been, um, and it gets really unclear for us to know who's supposed to send the letter first, um, who's supposed to send the letter of acceptance. Um, are there three letters? Are there two letters? Where do the letters go to? Um, I was just hoping to bring to the policy board that maybe it'd be a great idea if we came up with some sort of form that was really easy to fill out that said, here's the species that I intend on transferring and here are, uh, it is between the two states and um, here are what the stipulations are of that. Um, I know that that might require some later discussion with our federal partners um, because I recognize that they're also included um, on those transfer letters, but just something to make this a little bit more clear, concise um, and efficient, I think would be really useful for all of us. Yeah, just, just real quickly. Thanks, Shanna, for bringing that up. And, and there's, you know, a lot of moving parts on our end to, to, you know, respond to all those letters as well. But I, I don't recall the exact wording within some of the FMPs if it says, a letter will go from this state to that state. And if it specifically says a letter or if it just says in writing, in writing, I think a form would suffice for that. But if it, it does specify a letter it has to be written. So let us go back and look at what the wording is and we can see if we can streamline that a little bit. All right. Okay. Any other business? Uh, yep, Bob has one thing. Very quickly. Yeah, I just want to uh, introduce the commission's newest staff member um back in the back of the room simon kalstad is going to uh head up the commission's uh habitat program he'll be uh heading up the atlantic coastal fish habitat partnership as well so he's been here for i don't know almost a month now so he should be up and running and a uh, wily veteran at this point so uh, if you guys can all introduce yourself to simon he's in the back of the room so we just wanted to welcome him here and introduce you to everybody so thank you mr chair right. yeah, thanks and welcome simon to the three ring circus that is the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. All right, uh, with no other business, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'm gonna second. I assume, I assume there's no opposition. Uh, so we'll stand adjourned 